Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you guys are here. My name is Matt Wolf. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I want to. And I'd love to hear your story. That's why you need to fill out one of those forms, the new forms that arise in com slash connect. I'm glad you guys are here. Today is all about kids. We love kids here in our church, and we have a great kids ministry, but we're also going to do child dedication, and our message is about kids and what Jesus thought about kids. It's going to be a really great message. If you're like, I have kids, it's perfect for you. If you're like, I don't have kids, this message is perfect for you as well, as you'll learn in this message. Um, if you are here, you guys, if you're part of our church, you may have gotten an email letter from me this week about kind of some things going on in our church, in particular about our roof. You know, I felt very grateful, that's a weird word to say, a couple of weeks ago when there's the condo that fell in Miami because they had gotten a report from a structural engineer saying, you've got to fix this. Well, we got an almost identical report uh, a couple of years ago from a structural engineer saying, you've got to fix your roof on this historic building or else it could be a big deal. So we acted immediately, which we're very, that's what I'm grateful for, that we acted on it. And we didn't have all the money at first, but we were like, we've got to fix this so it doesn't collapse and kill anyone, Right. And we're glad we did. It's completely fixed, um, but we still owe about $27,000 on it, which isn't very much considering it was a quarter million dollar project, what it ended up being. But what I'm saying is I'm asking you guys to give, maybe a one-time gift right now. If you go to risedenver.com slash give and hit the raise the roof button, that's what we're calling this fun. Raise the roof. Can everybody do this with me? Just raise the roof. Yeah. And just give a one-time gift right now. And let's knock this out. Our fiscal year starts on October 1st. So we're trying to pay this all off over the next couple months. And I, I think we can do it, right? Let's pay it out, get out of debt, you know, and, and move on to the next fiscal year in good financial health. Can you guys do that? I, th I think we can. Thank you guys for your generosity. Okay, so today we are talking about kids. We're going to have child dedication at the end of the service. Uh, in the first service, we had two families and dedicated four kids between the two families. We have two families and three kids this service, I believe, that we're dedicating. We're excited about that. We love kids. We have a lot of kids. And there were like two families that couldn't make it to today's service to dedicate. So we got more dedications coming up because we love kids here, right? We got a lot of kids. Keep get, kids keep getting born here. Um, and it's, that's a great thing. We love it here uh, with, with the kids. And I, I wanted to tell you, I wanted to show you a couple video clips to tell you a little bit about my experience with kids because I remember these two moments that like drastically changed my life when it came to kids. So here's the first one, and this is after five years uh, of trying to get pregnant, IVF, all the money that came with that, and the trial that came with that, and then finally, I remember this day so clearly. It's not very loud yet, but it's gonna be so early. I will never forget that, not only hearing the heartbeat of our daughter McKinley, but also the look on my wife's face, right? I, I, I'm so glad I caught that because just seeing those tears of joy on her face were just so powerful. To know that you're having a child and your child, it's, it's just a powerful moment, those of you guys who have experienced it. it. changes your life forever. So that was the first moment. And the second one was a few years later, um, it, uh, I think this was beginning of 2019, about their spring 2019. Uh, I don't have the heart beats from the, this, the second time, but I do have this video when we found out what uh, the genders were of our um, twins. Oh, no. One, two. Oh. <laughs> that was blue, by the way. That was when we found out that we were having a boy and a girl. Um, we, it was amazing. And once again, I'll, I'll not only remember that moment, but looking at my wife as she's so excited that we're going to have two girls and a boy. And of course, we do have those three kids here. They're the ones running around everywhere. Those are my kids. If you see a kid running around, blame it on me. But that's okay because we love kids here. And that's how we should approach kids. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So whether you have kids of your own, you have grandkids, you maybe have nieces or nephews, or you're, you're like, I don't have any kids or any action, they're here in our church. So meaning we all need to learn how Jesus approached kids. And that's what we're going to l learn from just three verses today that are so important from the Gospel of Luke. As Luke describes this encounter Jesus has with, with a bunch of little kids. It's not just kids, little kids that Jesus has the interaction with. How he approaches them. So we're going to learn something important today. And we're going to learn to lead kids to Jesus and follow their lead. It's kind of two parts to this idea we're going to learn today. To lead kids to Jesus and follow their lead. Because there's something powerful that happens when kids can get around Jesus and be with him and learn from him. It's transformative. And also, we can watch the kids and learn something really powerful from them as well. 
So I hope that you guys are ready for this. If you have your Bible, go ahead and get with me to Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. Just three little verses. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can use that as well. You can go to, um, if you use the YouVersion Bible app, there's a little event there for Rice Church Denver. You can find it, find the scripture, take notes, write in your app and save them. And we're going to look at these three verses together as Jesus interacts with these kids. So, so look with me at Luke 18, 15. In verse 15, Luke, this historian, describes what happens. He says, people were also bringing babies to Jesus. See that word, babies, to Jesus. For him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Verse 16, but Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So here is this powerful moment that people are bringing their babies, yes, babies, to Jesus for him to put his hands on them. This would be a sign of blessing, to put his hand on them, to pray for them. And and a prayer of blessing, this would have been especially important in those days that 30 to 40% of all infants died before they made it, you know, till to being five, seven years old. So they would ask for protection from God, and they want Jesus, this this great man of God, even if they didn't know too much about him, they're like, we want Jesus to pray over our kids, to bless them. And this is really important. So people are bringing these kids to Jesus, and the disciples rebuke them. The disciples, the followers of Jesus, who were learning from him, they're like, Jesus, you're in the middle of a great sermon, and these kids are just distracting everyone. They're loud, they're running around, they're running up to Jesus. Them with their little sticky fingers are going to get it all over your robe, Jesus. They're going to be pulling on your hair. Like, let's, let's, okay, this is an important moment. We want people to hear what you have to say, Jesus. We got to get the kids out of here. So it's not like the disciples were were evil, like that they, they hated kids. They were just like, this is more important, right? But Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Nothing is more important than these kids because Jesus loves kids. He loves them. And you see when Jesus says, let the little children come to me, they came to him, meaning that Jesus must have been, must have been pretty awesome because you might have seen when, when you came in today, if I was holding my kids, they might not have smiled at you, especially our, our toddlers. They're you know, 19 months right now. They're a little nervous around new people, right? But, but these are babies. These are infants. These are toddlers probably. And they run up to Jesus, meaning that Jesus must have been pretty awesome. He is a fun guy. And he's like, come on up, kids. He's picking them up. They were like, oh, I want to turn. I want to turn. This is what the kids were doing to Jesus. They love him because he loves them and he's playing with them. Now, now this is a really big, uh, important image for us to see because maybe if you have seen this, you saw it like on the old flannel graph, you know, and, and there was Jesus with his nice blonde hair. And maybe he had like a little kid like this. Okay, for one, Jesus wasn't blonde. Sorry to burst your bubble, but he was a Middle Eastern Jew. Okay, so let's move on from that. Uh, get that image out of your mind. But these kids are probably running and jumping on him, and they're climbing all. Like, I was in the back with our kids during worship. Did anybody look back there? Some of you in the back. Megan, you're like, yes, I saw. Because they're all over the place, right? They're running around. They're, they're, I, I say Evie, our, our daughter, is like a, wrestling an eel trying to hold her, right? She's so bendy and just going everywhere. That's what these kids are coming up to Jesus, and he loves it. He doesn't see it as a distraction from the most important thing because this is the most important thing. The kid's coming to him so he can love them and care about them. And this is an important attitude for us because kids are important to God. Kids are very important to God. And Jesus like stands alone among religious figures. If you study other religious figures from the world, none of them cared about kids. They don't talk to kids. They don't teach kids. They're not playing with the kids, loving the kids, welcome up. But Jesus does. Out of the busyness of everything he's doing, he was like, please bring the kids. I want more of them. Bring the babies. I want to hold them. I want to touch them. I want to bless them because they're awesome. So, so Jesus stands alone here. And he also stood apart from the culture of his day. In, in that day, kids were like supposed to be neither seen nor heard. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, you know, once they're older, then they can learn. And, and then they have to be like much older before they can talk to us adults. That, that's how people treated it. And, and it was even worse in Roman society. Kids were like, maybe when they're eight years old, this is what the society thought, maybe when they're eight years old, they can go out and work in the fields and be worth something. People didn't love or value kids in Jesus' day. In fact, the Roman society, it was legal, get this, it was legal to take babies who were born that you didn't want and take them and put them in the trash heap, in the dump, and leave them. 
This happened all the time for kids that were born um, with physical or mental disabilities. And it happened a lot with baby girls because society didn't value babies. This was very common in those days. And actually, years after Jesus, because Christians learned from Jesus that Jesus loves kids, what they would do is Christians would go and, and go into the trash heaps and they would take those kids and take them home and adopt them and raise them and love them. And it was actually so transformative that um, the Roman Empire went from pagan, Jesus-hating, Christian-killing empire to a Christian empire within 300 years because the Christians so radically loved kids. It was one of the biggest things that changed that society. Interesting, right? Because Jesus loved kids, so therefore we as followers of Jesus must love kids as well. And if you're thinking, wow, those Romans were awful, think about our own society. Uh, there's um, two out of five children are killed before they're even born in our society. Two out of five. Almost 800,000 kids are killed every year in our country through abortion. What's really fascinating about this word baby that's used here, very specific, it uses the word baby in this passage, Luke uses it. He uses it four other times in the Gospel of Luke. Two of them refer to a baby still in the womb. Maybe you remember this from Luke chapter 1. It was Elizabeth. She's pregnant with John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And it says about the baby in Elizabeth's womb, leaped for joy and was filled with the Spirit in the womb. So it's possible, we don't know the details, it's possible that pregnant women were coming to Jesus and Jesus wanted, they wanted Jesus to put their hands and pray. Because Jesus loves babies. He loves kids. Even if it is different than the rest of society. Do you hear what I'm saying here? So that we as followers of Jesus must love kids as well. Especially the unborn children that our society casts out. Doesn't like. We love kids. We must follow Jesus and love kids as well. And, and I think we need to do that in our society. And we need to push back because like the Christians in the first century, in a society that hated kids, they were a shining light that transformed the society for the better. In the same way, we can do the same thing in our society to love kids, love the unborn, love the fatherless. We have people in our church that have adopted kids. We have one family right now that has three kids of their own and is fostering three other kids. We love that family. If you guys are watching at home, we love you guys. We want to support you. Anything you need, we're here for you guys because we as followers of Jesus love children. In fact, as we talked about a few weeks ago, this was like the trifecta of justice to care for the widows, the orphans, and the immigrants. Do you remember this? We talked about, specifically talking about the widows a few weeks ago. Because these are the people with the least power in society. And God, again and again and again and again, talked about those three. Care about them. So we too must care for the widows, the orphans, and the foreigners, the immigrants. We need to care for the kids and love the kids just like Jesus did. And here's the thing. Because kids are a blessing from God. Kids are a blessing from God. I want you to see this verse. Um, in, in Psalm 127, verse 3, it says that children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man, notice that, are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. Children are a blessing. This is like having your quiver full, going out to war. Okay? You, you don't want to have an empty quiver going to war. Saying this is a blessing, this is a good thing from God. And in particular, this passage says young men. I think in that day, as well as our own, this is important for men to hear. I'm a man. All you men here, young men, teenagers, young boys too, listen to this. We need to love kids, cherish them. Hear me? We need to love children, and we need to take the lead in loving kids because Jesus was a single dude, wasn't married, and yet he's the one playing with the kids and loving them. A lot of single dudes are like, I'm going to do anything I can to play video games, not get a real job, definitely not get married till maybe I'm 40-something, okay? But, but young, a young man, Jesus, is there playing with the kids, loving them. Bring them to me. I, I, can't, I love these kids. So we need to follow Jesus' lead, especially those of you who are young men. Yes, Thank you, Kenton. We, we love kids here. So I'm going to challenge men to step up. I have a great quote from the theologian, Don Corleone. <laughs> a man who doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. Thank you, Godfather. I think you're right. Real men love their kids. They're there for their kids. They support their kids. They're there 
at, at events, at graduations, at games. They're there to bring kids up on their lap, to hug them, to play with them, even when you're so exhausted at the end of a hard day and they keep saying more, more, more. I'm speaking from personal experience here, right? We love the kids. And men, we've got to take the lead on that to love our kids. Wouldn't it be great if our society had young men stepping up to love their kids and to love all the kids in our country? Have you ever noticed that all the problems in our society are like young men being stupid, right? What if young men stepped up to love and lead our kids? and lead them to Jesus. So that's my challenge. And I'm saying that in, in particular today because we have um, great kids' ministries here, and we're trying to reopen all of them because people are coming back. First service, the parking lot was full. Like, it was, it was packed in here again, we're, which is awesome. We love it. We have too many kids, and we don't have enough people serving to have all of our kids' classrooms open yet. I think it's a major problem. I think it's a major problem, and that, uh, that means that some of you guys need to step up and serve, in particular, men. I gave this challenge a couple months ago, and we had some great men step up with VBS. We had men like, like Kenny, like um, Taylor Dennington, who, who's still serving, and um, I'm trying to, I know there's some other men that I'm missing. Andre Hodison was serving. Like these men are like, yeah, I'll be there. So I want to challenge you guys men, step up, love the kids. Jesus was there. And here's a little thing here, this, is, this is a bonus point for you, young men. There's nothing more attractive to a woman than a man who loves kids, okay? Who cares about, like, swiping right on some stupid app? Just go serve in the nursery, okay? <laughs> I mean it. And you heard Sawyer, like, if you're like, I don't know about little kids, babies, like, I don't know. Like, well, we need people serving in our turbulence teen ministry, right? Our, our student ministry. And, and if you do love teenagers, God bless you, okay? But we need men, especially to serve. Everybody should step up, but men in particular. So if you're thinking, wow, I want to help in the classroom, I want to serve, or, or I can't serve on Sundays, but I can serve in the week. Well, we need some prep work done, too, so we could always use your help there. There's always a spot for you in kids' ministry. I want you to go to risedenver.com serve. If you have your phone, you can pull it out right now. You're allowed to pull out your phone in the service when I tell you to. You can take a picture of this. You follow the QR code and serve in our kids' ministry. We are already seeing more and more people come back, but we anticipate August, September, and October to be like bursting at the seams again because people are coming back and new people are engaging because they're spiritually hungry. So we need people to step up and serve in our kids and student ministries. We lead kids to Jesus here. We love kids like Jesus did. So, so let's do that. I don't see enough phones out today. If you're online, you can... QR code that too, or, or go to arisedenver.com slash serve. Fill out that serve somewhere form. And even if it's just to find out more information, we would love for you to serve the kids in our church. We love kids. We love kids here. So if we're going to lead kids to Jesus, I want to give you guys three practical things that we need to do. Because look at verse 16. It says, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So there's two things. We lead the kids to Jesus, and part of it is that kids like Jesus. These kids are running to Jesus. With my own young kids, they want to hear about Jesus. With McKinley, she loves to hear the Bible stories and, and, and talk about it. Kids are interested in, in Jesus. I think it's a lot of time us that get in the way. And that's why Jesus says, just don't hinder them, okay? Just don't get in the way, because too often, Christians get in the way of kids coming to Jesus. Get out of the way almost. So here's three practical ways that we can get out of the way and lead kids to Jesus. The first one is through our example. Through our example. Now this is particularly important for parents, but this goes for all of us because kids are watching every single person in the church. That's why this is a message for everybody. They're watching all the people. And, and when they see people go to church, raise their hands, singing hallelujah, talking a big talk, and then going outside of church and not walking the walk, it is a really big problem. It hinders kids from coming to Jesus. I remember talking with a man in Nebraska. So I was a pastor in Nebraska for five years before coming back here to Denver. And our church was really old. We were celebrating our 125th anniversary at the time. And we had this big celebration, and there was this guy in our church who was kind of like the like, resident historian of our church. And, and I remember at the celebration, he says, Matt, you've got to meet this guy. This guy came in. You've got to meet this guy because he is the grandson of one of the founders of our church. I was like, wow, that's cool. I'm like doing the math. I'm like 1892. You know, like that's a long time. This guy's the grandson of this founder. And I'm like, oh, so tell me about yourself. Well, it turns out he lives in the town, in our town. I'm like, our town isn't that big. Are you going to church? Where? No. I don't know you or anyone in your family, even though your grandfather helped build this church. 
Like, what is going on? You live here. And then as he's talking, he's like, oh yeah, my, great, my, my grandfather did, did some great stuff. He would go uh, up to, to the Wood River and he would go in the creek and he, he'd take the mud out and he'd build bricks. Can you imagine this? Making bricks. And then he'd put it in a wood cart and he'd carry it down across the bridge into town so that they could build this old building. And it was the, the old building because the new building was built in the 60s. Okay, and there's this old building like, yeah, he, he helped build that. I'm like, wow. And then this man was like, yeah, but then he came home and abused his wife and kids. He was a terrible man. At church, he was respected. He was a leader. Everybody looked up to him. But at home, he was awful. Nobody could stand him. And I said, ah, now it makes sense why no one in your entire family goes to church anymore. Because there's nothing worse than someone who's not living out their faith. A bad example to hinder kids from coming to Jesus. They see it. They want to make sure it matches up. Now, that's the bad example. Now, as good example as it comes, there's a great book called Revolutionary Parenting that studied what do good parents do that are Christians to have kids that grow up, that have strong faith, that are resilient. And the number one thing that parents do when they have successful kids is that they actually walk the walk. Okay? They don't have to be perfect. In fact, they probably apologize and ask for forgiveness more than anybody else from their kids. But they walk the walk. And if they live a godly example at home, matching their words on Sundays, it has a profound impact on the spiritual vitality of kids. So that's why our example is the first thing that I'm going to say if we want to lead kids to Jesus, your example. Second thing is our everyday. So if the first thing is your example, the second thing is your everyday. Is Jesus in your everyday life? And this is very simple things like, oh, isn't that a great sunrise? Man, God's awesome. I'm glad God created that. Simple things like that. Is it part of your everyday life? Some easy ways to do this are to pray at meals. You're bringing Jesus into your everyday, into food. Or at nighttime. This is a great time. Parents, are you bringing Jesus into your nighttime routine? I want to tell you what I'm doing right now with McKinley. She's four and a half. And um, this is just what we're doing right now. I, I used to be like intimidated because like I thought, oh, you got to do like these crazy devotionals and pull out a hymnal and like sing along every night to the hymnal. And I'm like, man, I don't know. Some of you are like, that's terrifying. Okay, it, it just bring Jesus into your nighttime routine. So this is what we do at night. We have a whole bunch of different kids' Bibles. The one we're on right now is called My Awesome God. I'll hold that up for the camera. It's pretty awesome. It's like comic book, like pictures. And we just go through it. And it's okay if the kid doesn't understand everything, okay? We try to talk about some things. So we'll read a story every night with McKinley. And then we have this book that we're going through right now. It's called What Every Child Should Know About Prayer. It's a simple little book. And it's great. And it talks about prayer. And then we pray together every night. So that's, that's another simple book that we're just reading. And it's just one page, guys. Don't, don't think I'm like reading chapters. Of it. It, it's a whole chapter, one page. And then I just got this one two weeks ago. I'm really excited about this one. And so is McKinley. It's called Courageous World Changers. 50 True Stories of Daring Women of God. I was like, this will be good. And last night we, we started late, so we only got through the first two books. And she was like, what about the courageous women, Dad? I was like, tomorrow. Okay, but So we're not perfect. I'm telling you guys this. We miss some nights. I'm not, I'm not perfect. Sometimes we get busy, we're tired. But I, but I try to just bring Jesus into everyday life. And, and this book is so cool because it talks about great Christian women that have done amazing things for our world. I'm like, the, that's what I want McKinley to do. <laughs> and Evie after it has women like uh, Corey Ten Boom. It has women like Susan B. Anthony who are Christians and, and put their faith into practice, Sojourner Truth. E- even um, one of the ones we, we did the other night was, uh, I can find it. I don't even know where it is now. Give me a minute. Gabby Douglas. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. Gabby Douglas. Gabby Douglas, as a Christian, was competing in the games. And so we watched her 2012, you know, floor routine together on my phone, which is pretty cool, and talked about her faith in in the book and how that led her to um, practice and get better. The point is, are you bringing Jesus into your everyday life? You you could use these books. They're great. Amazon, you could probably give me some money for plugging those, but wherever you get them, like any books, just bring Jesus into your everyday life. And that's just a simple way that you can do it every night. And, and then after that, because Melissa's with the twins, rocking them, getting them ready, she'll come in and she'll pray with McKinley and she sings worship songs to McKinley. If you don't have a great voice, don't worry, you don't have to do that. 
But Melissa does that, and we'll sing prayers to McKinley. So we're just bringing Jesus into everyday life. So that's the second thing that I want you guys to do. Bring Jesus into your everyday. The third thing, if we want to lead kids to Jesus, is to bring Jesus into your every week. And by that, I mean worship weekly. We mentioned it in the video, if you saw for the promo for the message series starting next week, is that kids are in a mental health crisis. We talked about it in a message a few weeks ago. The chief medical officer for Children's Hospital here in Denver declared that we're in a child and teenager mental health crisis right now because of the pandemic. It's bad. They've never seen it worse here. Things are bad here. And, and people are like wondering, well, what, what's going on? And they were like, well, it's because of what's happening before this. Because what do you need to get through a crisis? You need faith. And you need a strong faith. And even then, it's hard. And here's a fascinating thing. I have to show you this because I didn't think you would believe me. Back in 2019, there was this article, and it was an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal, written by an atheist who said, don't believe in God, lie to your children. Did, did you guys hear me? You guys can see this, right? This was in there, 2019. Don't believe in God, lie to your children. The alternative is to tell them they're simply going to die and turn to dust. No, no, no wonder why so many kids are depressed. Seriously. In the article, she cites a study, because this is an atheist, by the way, an atheist therapist who's like telling parents what to do. Just bring your kids to church. She specifically says, bring them to church because kids, if they go to church once a week or better, bring them to Turbulence here on Wednesday nights, do all your other stuff too, but if they go once a week on average, they will have better psychological well-being. They report much higher cases, so that's their health and their happiness, and much less chance of having mental health problems. Just church once a week. An atheist said this. You guys hear me? You guys are very quiet today. So, <laughs> thank you, Ben. The point is, your kids need Jesus, even if you don't believe. <laughs> so I'm saying that you need to make this part of your routine. Some of you have gotten so far out of the habit. You haven't been a weekly churchgoer in years. This whole last 17 months has been terrible for you. Some of you are still watching online. Your kids haven't come back. Bring them back. I mean it. Bring them back. They need to be here to hear a lesson about Jesus and see other Christians worshiping, see other people living out their faith that they know, they rub shoulders with. It's even the interactions. It's not just like in here or, or in their kids' class. It's the interactions that are going on all over the place. They build friendships. They meet, meet mentors and role models. Kids need to be here weekly, and it has a transformative impact on even their mental health, let alone their eternal salvation, which is a pretty big deal. You guys tracking with me on this? Make this part of your weekly habit to worship weekly. This is just for kids. It helps adults too, by the way. And I think what happens, I think what happens is you're like one week, oh, we're going camping next weekend. Oh, that's fine, right? We're just a little vacation. And then the week after, some friends are in town. Let's go out to brunch. And then it's another kid's birthday party. And then we sign them up for sports and the, the competition's on Sunday, right? And then all of a sudden it's months and you haven't been in a church at all. This is what happens. I don't think it's on purpose. But we fall out of the habit, and then we wonder, why are our kids struggling so much? Well, I'm, I'm telling you why. An atheist can tell you why. They need to build resilient faith here. Vody Bauckham, I think, gets this right. I have this quote from Vody Bauckham, a pastor. He says, if I teach my son to keep his eye on the ball, but fail to teach him to keep his eyes on Christ, I have failed as a father. Right? Gets here, right? So that's my challenge to you guys. Make this part of your weekly routine, your weekly habit. Build everything else around that, your weekly habit. So how do we lead kids to Jesus? Through our example, through our every day, and every week. But there's a second part to my big idea from this passage. We lead kids to Jesus and follow their lead. We follow their lead. So there's something important that we learn from kids as well, and I want you guys to see this from the very last verse in our passage. Verse 17 Jesus says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. This whole series is about unexpected examples. He's pointed at a widow, learned to, to persist in prayer. You know, persistent prayer pays off from this widow. From a sinner, learn from the sinner, imitate him, that you need to humble yourselves in order to be exalted. And here from the kids, we're supposed to learn from their example of faith. Perhaps you've heard this, that we need to have childlike faith. I've heard messages on this. People have taught about it. And it, people say, oh, it could mean this, it could mean that. And there's all sorts of different things. So I was really trying to figure out, well, what does it mean? 
If we want to enter the kingdom of God, that sounds great. I would love to be a part of the kingdom of God. What does it mean? Well, we need to receive the kingdom. Now, that is a bizarre phrase to me that Jesus said. If you want to um, enter the kingdom of God, you must receive it like a child. He doesn't say enter it like a child, does he? Receive it like a little child. And as he's pointing at the babies, you know, he's using this object lesson. So you see the kids here. Be like them. Follow their example. So what does that mean? It seems bizarre to say receive something to enter it. And whenever you find something bizarre in the Bible, it's probably the key to understanding what it means. So I thought about it. Think about this. What does, it, what does a little kid do? How do they receive something? Well, they receive everything. Let me tell you about bringing our kids to Chick-fil-A on Wednesday night. If you work there, I'm sorry. When we went to Chick-fil-A, what, what did my kids need me to do? They needed me to strap them into their car seats, to drive them over there, to get out. McKinley can kind of pick out our food, but the twins can't at all. So we have to order for them, right? We have to get their food. We have to cut it up into small bites for them. With the twins, Melissa's got one, I've got the other. We're, we're trying to get it. We're trying to get it in their mouths. We get their milk ready and put the straw in it and try to hold it so they don't spill it, but of course they spill it. Sorry. And we have to clean it up, right? And, and then they're getting milk everywhere and then trying to open up the ketchup for them because they have to receive the, me opening up this ketchup. And Canaan actually did really well. No ketchup on me, milk all over me, right? Here, here's the thing that I've learned as, as a dad. I cannot go through an entire day with clean pants. I'm serious. I don't have clean pants today because somebody's grabbing me. Okay, this is my life. You know, they poop on you, they puke on you, they grab you with sticky hands, there's ketchup everywhere. I don't know. This is what kids do, right? Because they need you to do everything. And then at the end, we got them ice cream because they got great ice cream at Chick-fil-A. Somebody, somebody's like, ooh, that sounds good. Sorry, they're not open today. <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> but we were there, and I got ice cream, and then I have to spoon it in their mouth. But he doesn't want me to spoon it in their mouth. He wants me to get it in the spoon so then he can grab the spoon and put it in his own mouth, right? But everything, I'm doing everything for Canaan that night. That's what you do for a little kid. They receive everything. When it's time to go, what do they do? Daddy, lift me up. Put me back in the car seat and take me home. And I'm going to be exhausted because it was a crazy night. I had too much sugar. Okay, you've got to do everything for little kids, right? Everything. And it's awesome, by the way. <laughs> crazy and awesome, and you never have enough energy, but you love it. Okay, that's what kids are like. And, and if we're supposed to be like the little kids, so Jesus points at those kids, receive the kingdom like them. Receive, receive, receive. They receive everything. They bring nothing to the table, sorry. Maybe their cuteness, sometimes. It wears off sometimes, right? They receive everything. You've got to do everything for them. So in the same way, in our faith, we need to reach out our hands to our Father in heaven and say, help me. I need you. Because we receive everything. We bring nothing to the table in our salvation. We talked about that last week completely reliant on our Father in heaven. You do everything. You forgive me. You save me. You give me gifts of the Holy Spirit. You give me the power to serve. The money that I'm giving, you actually gave to me first. What we do is receive, receive, receive. And that's actually the type of faith we're supposed to have. Completely reliant on Jesus. That's what receiving the kingdom like a child means. It means complete reliance on Jesus. So Jesus says, yes, love the kids. Lead them to me. And now watch them and follow their lead as they come to me and receive and receive and receive. That's a good thing because we are the ch children of God and we must be born again like a little child. You guys caught that before? Jesus said that to Nicodemus, a grown man. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Same idea there. Become like a child and receive everything knowing that you bring nothing to the table. That's what true faith is. And I think one of the reasons why Jesus was like this, as, as a single dude, <laughs> loving the kids, leading them, teaching us through their example, was because Jesus himself was a kid. Have you thought about this? Luke uses the word baby in this passage five times in his gospel. Two of them we talked about were with the um, unborn John the Baptist. Two of them were about a baby that was lying in a manger. Do you know who that baby was? Jesus. So Jesus was a baby. Have you ever thought about this? He was an infant who cried, who drooled, who had sticky fingers, pooped. Somebody had to clean it up, and they didn't have disposable diapers in those days. Okay, that was, that was Jesus, the God of the universe. This is bizarre. No other faith practices something like this. The, the God of the universe would empty himself, lower himself to be a baby completely reliant on his parents. And there Mary was taking care of him. And his adoptive father, Joseph, 
who took care of him and loved him and raised him. And we're told in Luke chapter 2 that Jesus grew. He was a child. He had to learn everything. He grew in wisdom and stature, it says, and he grew in favor with God and with man. Jesus grew. He learned faith. He studied the Bible. And he grew all those things, and he grew into the man who we know and love. So I think when he's saying, let the little babies come to me, let the kids come to me, because I was a baby. I was a kid. I know what it's like. And kids are what it's about. They're so important. I love them. And, and I love that when Jesus went on the cross, do you know one of the very last things he said when he was dying for us? Do you know what he said? Father, Daddy, into your hands I commit my spirit. Completely reliant on his Father in heaven. That's Jesus. That's our gospel. And that's why we need to learn to lead kids to Jesus so they can know that Jesus and follow their lead and have a childlike faith. Would you pray with me? Lord God, uh, I know that this message has been challenging to some of us. We, we stand before you as imperfect parents, as imperfect men and women and children. We have not always had a great example for our kids. We've said things that we shouldn't have. We've lived in a way that we shouldn't have. But Lord God, would you forgive us and would you help us today to step up, to lead the kids around us to you, to the Savior. We're not the Savior. We need to lead them to you. And we need to get out of the way sometimes to not hinder them. I pray that with our example, our every day, and with our every week, we would lead kids again and again to you so that they would find eternal life in you, that they too would receive the kingdom of God and enter into it. And Lord God, I, I, I pray for all, everyone in here, for the parents especially, and for the young men, that they would learn to have a heart that loves kids. I know some in here are hearing this and they're like, Matt, I don't love kids. I'm annoyed by them. I find them disgusting and frustrating. Lord God, would you change their hearts? Would you change my heart so that we would love our kids more and more, the kids around us in church, that we would step up to love them and lead them to you in all that we do. Now, with eyes closed right now, there are some of you in here who have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't your Lord and Savior, and that means that you are not a child of God, you do not have eternal life, and you are not in the kingdom of heaven. But the simple solution is to receive the kingdom like a little child. In faith, you need to cry out, I need your help. Forgive me of my sin, give me eternal life. I receive. So what we do here is for those who are ready to make that step of faith, we have a prayer that you can repeat after me. And if you're already a believer, we ask that you'd say this prayer too to give courage to someone who needs to pray it for the first time. So would you please repeat this prayer after me? Dear God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I need a savior. Save me. Forgive me. In faith, I declare, Jesus is king. I receive your spirit. Help me to follow you for the rest of my life. Now, with eyes still closed, if you said that prayer for the first time, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior today for the first time, slip your hand into the air. Slip your hand into the air. If you're online, go to risedenver.com slash follow. Fill out that form. We would love to encourage you, get you connected with someone who could just challenge you, encourage you on this new journey of faith. And, and Lord God, we come, every single one of us, before you, our Father in heaven. And we pray that you pour out blessings on us and on our children and on generations to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand in this worship? And we're going to worship for a little bit, and then we're going to do our child dedications.